the patient sees it in front of you, EMS is telling you that they weren't able to get an IV, so they gave them high first set while they were on the roof. So if you bring the patient into the recess bed, you put them on the monitor, and here are your vitals. So you look at his arms, you try to secure an IV, you see crack marks all over, and you can't get that IV. What do you do? Right. Uh, so I'm going to talk about IOs. Um, we'll go over the indications, the contraindications, where the insertion sites, some of the technique and landmarks for those insertion sites. Uh, we'll do a brief comparison with central lines, and then some of the complications of the IOs. And then last but not least, where that we find all this stuff in Grand State and Kings County. So the indications really is when you have a patient who's crashing, you're not able to get IV access by conventional means. So you try getting that peripheral and you can't get it. And you need it urgently. Um, the situations that you commonly hear of are like status epilepticus, uh, cardiac arrest, trauma. And the contraindications, I kind of break them up into categories. So the first one is factors that are going to decrease the delivery of the infusion. So this would be things like a proximal ipsilateral fracture, a local vascular injury, if there's been previous attempts at ipsilateral access. And all of these things can also increase your risk of uh, developing compartment syndrome. So, um, also patients have a high risk of fracture, so con uh, conditions like OI, osteoporosis, um, conditions where you are going to have a decreased ability to get through it. What just happened? Through the cortex. So osteoporosis, if there's hardware within the bone or within the nearby joints. And then if you have overlying cellulitis or neurocardiopathic. Really the only absolute contraindications are these top three. So the basic principle of it is you have a catheter that goes through the bony cortex into the medullary cavity. And within the medullary cavity, apart from all the hematopoietic precursors, you have these sinusoids. They drain into a central vein within the bone, and that central vein within the bone goes out into the central vasculature, central venous system, and thereby you're able to deliver your infusion, your medication throughout. So your insertion sites, you have the proximal tibia, distal tibia, distal femur, proximal humerus. And then you also have the sternum, the anterior iliac spine, and the distal radius. Now with these last three, you really only do it in adults, and it's with the manual um, IO infusion, rather than with the automatic one. What we have, we have the easy IO. Um, so I was a little drill. I had my hand holding in the very beginning. Um, so the sites for that, you have the proximal and distal tibia, proximal humerus and distal femur. So the materials you're going to need, you want your sterile gloves, you want chloroprep, um, you want your drill, you want your needle sets. And there's three different needles. Um, they're all differing lengths, all over 15 gauges. And the whole principle is you see all of these like black uh, markings on the needle, and those mark like a centimeter. Um, so you want this most proximal black marking to be visible when you insert it into the patient, when you've gone through the subcutaneous tissue and gone to the periosteum. And the idea behind that is you have a greater chance of actually penetrating the cortex and getting into the medulla. Because if you insert it in there, and you don't actually get into the bone. It's pretty useless. Uh, you'll need your Urlock, um, some flushes, tubing. Um, if you want to draw labs, the tubes for those. You need your dressing, some chucks or towels. <laughs> So first thing you want to do is you want to figure out where exactly you want to insert your IO. So do you want it to be in the proximal tibia, distal tibia, proximal humerus? And there's advantages and disadvantages to both depending on the patient context. Um, and you also want to select your needle tip depending on how big the patient is, how much they weigh. You want to position them and prep the site with your chloroprep. And then if they're conscious, you use 1 to 2% lidocaine. Use your non dominant hand and someone who's helping you to stabilize the site. And you position the needle tip, and the angle at which you're entering is important. So, if you are 
going for the tibia or the femur, if you want it to be completely perpendicular to the bone and away from the joint space. Whereas if you're going to the humerus, you want it to be 45 degrees to the anterior plane and directed posterior medial. So you're going to press the drill trigger, guide the needle through the tissue until you feel a sudden loss of resistance. And then you stabilize the hub with your non-dominant hand. You just pull off the drill and you unscrew it with the stylus. And at this point, it can become kind of unstable. So you don't want to let go and have it fall out of the bone. You'll place your dressing over the hub, and then you'll attach the extension set to the hub. If you want to draw off any labs, this would be the time to do it. Um, then you secure the dressing, and then you flush it um, to clear the medullary space, and you can give 10 milliliters per adults, two to five milliliters per pediatric patients. For the proximal tibia, you want to feel two finger breadths below the tibial tuberosity, and you're going to go on that anteromedial surface. So you're going to prep the skin, of course, first. Now with your drill, here they're using the yellow one. The blue would also work. Yellow might be a little long, so you just don't want to have it. You're going to advance it through the skin, and then drill until you feel give. That's how you know you're in the medullary cavity. Don't push it beyond that, because you don't want to go through the medullary cavity. Move the stylet, and you can place that fancy, beautiful dressing. And now you can hook up your tubing. So they're going to draw off some labs here, which is great for things like H and H and type and screen. But some of your elements of your chemistry panel are going to be very different from your serum level, so you want to be careful. And remember, you can give any medication through an IO line. For infants and kids less than six years old, the proximal tibia is actually the preferred site. Here are some other options for placement. You can go in the distal tibia as well, and basically it's like the medial ankle, where the medial malleolus meets the shaft of the tibia. Another option is the distal femur, and for that you would go two finger breadths above those wide condyles of the knee, and that's right smack in the middle. And finally, there's the humeral head, and you're going to go in the greater tuberosity of the humerus. Now, if you're going to do this in an awake patient, So we'll go over some landmarks. So if you're going through the proximal humerus, you want the patient to be lying supine and have their arm internally rotated such and um, abducted such that their palm is over their abdomen. And then you're going to take, if you're going through the right arm, you're going to take your right hand and use the ulnar aspect, almost like if you were to do a karate chop, and put it above the axilla. And what this does is it, it delineates between the medial and the anterior um, aspects of the humerus, the medial aspect, because you want to avoid that because that's where the brachial plexus is. So you've got your right hand over the axilla, you take your left hand and you place it perpendicular and at the midline um, into, towards the patient's arm, and then you bring your thumbs together and where they join, you should feel a vertical groove, and that's kind of where you're hanging for vertically. So you're going to palpate proximally until you feel like the surgical neck, and then a couple of centimeters above that is where you aim. And this angle, so remember I talked about it being 45 degrees uh, posterior medial and anterior. Um, and that's because you want to avoid the growth plate. If you just do it perpendicular to the bone, you can go into the growth plate. So the proximal tibia for adults, you're going to have the leg fully extended. You're going to use two finger widths just distal to the patella. And then a finger width to two finger widths medial to that. And that should be the tibial plateau, which is medial to the tibial porosity. With a pediatric patient, it's similar, except it's one finger width, really, and one finger width distal to the patella, and then one finger width medial. For the distal tibia, you're going to feel for the most prominent aspect of the medial malleolus, and then about three finger widths or so medial to that, and then midline, and you use one hand to kind of palpate the anterior and posterior aspects of the distal tibia. And then for an infant or a child, it's similar to that, except it's really about one centimeter uh, proximal to that prominence. <laughs> and then finally, for the distal femur, you want, again, the leg to be fully extended. You're going to palpate for the proximal aspect of the patella, and then it's one centimeter anterior to that. I'm sorry, one centimeter proximal to that, and then slightly medial is where you're aiming. So how do you know you've got it in? 
So the first thing, obviously, you should have a sudden loss of resistance when you're drilling. Um, the needle should feel stable. This is before you remove the stylet. Uh, you should be able to aspirate marrow and blood, obviously. Uh, you should be able to give some saline without the tissue swelling around it. And then you should be able to give 8 millimeters of saline without resistance. And this doesn't I mean there's like, I should rephrase that. It shouldn't mean no resistance. There will be a little bit of resistance, but it's not going to be like complete unable to push it. It'll definitely be harder than when you're just flushing an IV. So a brief comparison with crash lines. So there's a study that I found from 2012 in resuscitation. It was in Germany, but they compared central lines versus IOs and the same practitioners. Um, they um, found that to place an IO and to place a central line um, without using ultrasound, just using landmarks, it took about two minutes for an IO, whereas it took eight minutes for a central line. Um, there are other studies that they quote where it's even lower, it gets to even as low as one minute for an IO, but I don't know the full details of those studies. And they found the first time success rate was 65% for a central line versus 85% for an IO. Um, both of these, you really only leave them in for 24 hours, but with a crash central line, you can put it in really just in the hospital, whereas EMS can put in an IO. And you can give anything through an IO. You can give pressors, you can give your antiarrhythmics, you can give your blood products, you can give your crystalloids, contrast foods. So the complications, um, there's cellulitis, there's osteo, and you can cause a cutaneous abscess. And this really you see if you keep it in for longer than 24 hours or when you initially put it in, you didn't prep the site properly, you weren't sterile. Uh, you can generate compartment syndrome. And that happens with like extravasation or if there have been previous attempts at ipsilateral access. You can obviously cause a fracture. If you're not careful with your landmarks, you can injure the growth plates with pediatric patients. And in animal studies, they have described fat embolisms, but there's no translation to that uh, with humans, but it's theoretically possible. So where do you find it? At UHB, you have one in the pediatric medications room, and then in the recess bay. Everything should be in that yellow thing, um, the yellow little briefcase. Um, if anything's missing, you can ask the charge nurse or Mr. ED, and they can get it replenished. There's more things in the central supply. <coughs> so Kings County, places you have it. You have it in the Pixis, in the trauma bay, and then you have it in the bottom drawer of the pediatric crash carts, theoretically. I didn't open it up um, because I didn't feel like getting rid of it. So my take home points for you guys, um, whenever there's a patient who's crashing and you can't get that peripheral, strongly consider putting in an IO rather than a crash central line. Um, just remember how to insert the IO, including the landmarks for the humerus, the proximal and distal tibia, and the distal femur. Technique for doing it, <coughs> where do you find the IOs um, in hospitals? Uh, here are the references. And I want to thank Dr. Scrooge and Sarah and Regan for their feedback. Uh, questions. So this may seem obvious, but if you're in a code scenario, you would prefer to put the line, put the IO in the humeral area as opposed to the tibia, so you're giving less impressions to get the epi there or whatnot. Um, and also, <coughs> always aspirate before you start. It. It's confusing. What was the person who said you were going to go up? Before. So you're closer to the heart. Oh, right. the humerus. Um, I was in a Um, just also want to say that we have a, a different type of IO as well. We have both the easy IO, which is the drill, uh, but as, especially at county, it's kind of hard to get that because it's in the fixes, and if you're in a crash situation, those extra few minute, seconds or sometimes minutes are tough. We also have the manual trocar, which is only one piece of equipment. It's fully sterile. Um, it has this kind of plastic thing that goes into your palm, and you drive it in. Uh, those are located in room three 
in the uh, access cart, which is third from the left. Can you wait patients? Isn't there something about injecting lidocaine into the bone afterwards? Yeah. Like not just in the skin that goes into the bone? Yeah. You, no, you put it to the periosteum. Um, so make sure you're using cardiac enemy. Otherwise, that's a bad idea. So the one out of the crash part, because that's specifically formulated to be the OIV. 